Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. It's a pretty straightforward story on its surface. Joseph's fiance, Mary, is pregnant. Joseph is a good guy at least according to the standards of the time. So rather than publicly humiliate her, which was his right, rather than express all of his emotions, his sorrow, his anger, his grief, by taking her out to the gate and exposing her for her sin, Joseph decides that the best thing to do, the right thing to do, is to quietly dismiss her and move on with his life. And we can all understand that. That seems like a sensible decision to make. Sometimes you just have to cut your losses and move on. I mean, how many of us have stories about people we dated when we were younger, boyfriends and girlfriends that we had, and at some point we cut our losses or we got dumped, one or the other, (laughs) but we moved on. Joseph has decided it's time to move on. He doesn't believe Mary's testimony that the child is from God. None of us would have believed her either. Joseph can't forgive her, or at least he can't come to grips with the smirch on his own reputation that staying with her would give him. And we don't blame him, do we? I mean, don't we look at the first part of this story before the dream, before the angel, before the command of God? Don't we look at Joseph and think, That is a defensible decision that he made. He made the best of a hard situation. Even Matthew says that he planned to dismiss her quietly because he was a righteous man. That's exactly the problem. This righteousness of Joseph, this righteousness that we all understand when we say he did it because he was a good guy, This righteousness, if followed through, would have abandoned Mary to raise her child by herself without the support of a husband. This righteousness would have left Mary a scandal to her community, cut off from the help she would need to keep her child safe and provided for. Joseph's righteousness would have gotten him sympathetic pats on the back, as people say, that's too bad, but you did the best you could. While faith-filled, humble, obedient Mary would have been on her own. And she likely would have seen friends and neighbors and maybe even family turn their back on her and whisper about her sin. If this is the result of righteousness, then we have a problem. It is this righteousness that Jesus has come to fix. In Joseph's day, righteousness was easily defined as obedience to the law. If you obeyed the Ten Commandments and the 600 plus other laws that were written in the Bible, then you were considered righteous. If you obeyed the laws about how to worship, how to eat, how to dress, whom to marry, how to treat your neighbor, then you were considered righteous. And even though nobody did it perfectly, At least you could say, I'm better than so-and-so. And And if you thought you were doing it better than other people, 
then you felt pretty good about yourself. Joseph was righteous. He took his faith seriously. He knew his Bible, and he did his best to obey its rules. But clearly, if doing all of that leads you to abandon the mother of God, then there's something wrong with your righteousness. We see this kind of thing all the time in our world, especially in the church. How many people have been hurt and abandoned by churches who were just enforcing the rules? Enforcing rules they could defend with Scripture. I've met many former Catholics in Lutheran churches who are there because they got divorced and remarried and weren't allowed communion in their home church. Made them feel unwelcome, and so they left. And I wonder how many of those who had that experience didn't find their way to a Lutheran church or any church at all, but stopped going altogether. I've talked with women who were barred from leading Bible study because the church they were at didn't believe that women should have leadership over men. In both situations, you can back up your position with Scripture. You can argue that it's righteous. But can it be righteous if it leaves people wounded on the side, hurt by the church, the very body of Christ? There's a debate here, because on the other hand, should we just abandon all the rules and all the standards and just let people do whatever they want? Do we really have to have rules and guidelines to follow? I read a story recently about a seminary in the East who, in their chapel service, set up a bunch of plants on display in the altar area and had the congregation pray to the plants for forgiveness. That was my reaction. (laughs) That's the kind of thing that happens when we kind of throw the rules out the window and say, people, just do whatever you want. I remember doing a premarital counseling service with a couple, and I always give an assessment out to the couples before they come in. And this couple scored the lowest of any couple I had ever done counseling with. And I thought, what am I going to do when they come in? And they came in, and I sat down with them, and I went through the counseling session. They got into three fights during the session. (laughs) And at the end, I said, folks, I can't do your wedding. I can't marry you, at least not on the timeline that you have set. They had it set for a month out. So I said, I can't, I won't do it until you get some further counseling and make sure this is right. What do you think their reaction was? Oh, they were mad. The woman stormed out of my office. The man stayed behind just to give me a few choice words before he left. I never saw them again. They got someone else to do their wedding. And I wonder, was I right? Did I make the right decision to deny their wedding? Should we have standards for whom we marry? Or should I have just swallowed my concerns, kept my opinions to myself, and done their ceremony. What was the righteous thing to do in that situation? And I don't know. I don't know if I made the right decision. Someone else married them. This was 10 years ago. I don't know if they're still married or not. I hope I was wrong. I hope they got married and are happily married. But here's the thing. We are not very good at deciding what is right and what is wrong, at choosing what is righteous. Even when we do what we think is right, like Joseph was doing, it can turn out very wrong and hurt people in the process. The lie that was told to us in the Garden of Eden by the serpent who said, if you eat this fruit... You will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. It was a lie. We don't know the difference. Half the time, we do what is evil, thinking that it's good. Most of the time, the results are mixed at best. 
Very few people in this world do evil thinking that it's evil. Most of them think they're doing some kind of good. It's why we're so divided in this world. Two groups can look at the same set of facts and come to completely opposite conclusions about what is right and good and what course of action to take. We are just not good at being good, at choosing between right and wrong. Joseph tried to be good, but his decision would have been disastrous. But that's why God was sending Jesus in the first place, to give us righteousness as a gift, to show us how to be righteous, how to follow God and be faithful in this very confusing world. So God intervened. Joseph went to sleep thinking that he had made a good decision, and God intervened, sent him an angel in a dream to say he had chosen the exact wrong course, and he should not be afraid to take Mary as his wife. See, God breaks into this world, into our moral dilemmas, to bring us the one person who is truly righteous, who is truly good, who always makes the right call. Notice the promises God gives to Joseph about who the child will be. The angel says, you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture says that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. As I said last week, we don't live up to our own standards, let alone God's. Even if we have good intentions, even if we are considered by everyone around us as good men and women, we still make the wrong call thinking it's right and hurt people in the process. Who will rescue us from our sins? Who will save us from our self-righteousness? Jesus is the one who comes to rescue us. Jesus is the one whom God has sent into our confusion to bring us light and clarity and truth, to show us the way, to save us from our sins. When you hear that phrase, save us from our sins, what does that mean to you, to be saved? I remember when I was a, a kid, I visited my grandmother who lived in San Diego and I swam in the Pacific Ocean for the first time in my life. And it was glorious. I was doing the boogie boarding and the body surfing and all of that. And I didn't really know the, the rules of the beach. It wasn't a culture I grew up in. And I was out there in the ocean and all of a sudden the, the sea got kind of calm and I, I looked around and everybody was gone. There was nobody around me. And I, I heard a whistle coming from the shore and I, I looked toward the shore and there was a lifeguard blowing his whistle at me, waving his arms, beckoning me to come back in. And so I started turning toward the shore, but every step I took, I was getting less and less traction, less and less ground was touching my toes, and I was going out to sea. I was caught in a riptide, but I didn't even know what a riptide was. The lifeguard saw me struggling, saw that I wasn't making progress on my own, and swam out to me, picked me up in his arm, and planted me down safely on the shore. And I was so embarrassed, I didn't even say thank you. I just ran off to find my grandma. But he saved me. He saved me. That's what it means to be saved. It means to be plucked out of a situation that we can't improve on our own. It means to be rescued from something that will lead to our destruction. And that is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has come to us to save us. Us who are stuck in our sins. We who are trying our best to move in the right direction but are not making progress on our own. Jesus comes to rescue us. Because he alone is good. He alone is righteous. 
When we are baptized, we are united with Jesus. We are given the gift of his righteousness. We are clothed with Christ. We are forgiven of our sins, saved from our sins. We are called to faith in Jesus. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Matthew says that Jesus will be called Emmanuel. God with us. God has returned to his creation to walk with us again as he walked with us in the Garden of Eden before we bought the lies of the serpent. This is the fourth and last week of Advent. That word Advent simply means to come. God has come to us through Jesus, through that baby that was born. Jesus is God walking with us, teaching us what it actually looks like to be good and righteous. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Forgive those who sin against you. Become a servant of all. Give to the poor and the hungry. Visit those in prison. Have compassion on the sick and the needy. Turn the other cheek. Bless. Do not curse. Give to God what is God's. Have faith. In Jesus. He is Emmanuel. He has come to us and he has saved us. So instead of trying to figure out how to be good ourselves, we are invited instead to follow Jesus. Let him guide us. Some of us in this room may still be like that little boy trying to fight the riptide all on his own deceiving ourselves that we don't need help, that we can do this life by ourselves. If that's you, I invite you to repent. You cannot save yourself. Surrender instead to Jesus, the lifeguard, who comes to rescue all who believe in him. Ask him to forgive your sins. Ask him to to rescue you from your failed attempts to save yourself. As we approach the celebration of Christmas, may we be like Joseph, who was willing to give up his own plan, as righteous as he thought it was, and trust instead in the plan of God. May we have faith and courage and be obedient to the God who has come all the way down to where we are to rescue us, to save us. Amen.